Hello everyone, my name is Tim Hansen, and today I'm going to be going over how to configure a SonicWall SMA 1000 series appliance, specifically a 8200B virtual appliance. I'm intending on a pretty simple configuration today, essentially going through how to license the product, setting up authentication, configuring an endpoint control policy, and then giving VPN users access to a terminal server on the LAN. And then subsequent follow-up videos to this might focus on the more complex use cases for the appliance. So the network architecture I have my 8200V deployed into is pretty straightforward. I have the appliance installed in a DMZ off of a NSV270, which behind it on the LAN is sitting, of course, my terminal server. Now there's different ways of integrating the appliance into an existing network which the admin guide actually does a pretty good job of explaining the various methods. I've only chosen this method because it was, well, simplest to deploy into my existing environment or my lab. It should be noted that before we begin, I did have to configure some access rules, natting and such on my NSV270 in order to make this all work. So presumably your firewall or router may also need some additional configuration to make traffic flow nicely between your internal network, the SMA 8200V and your VPN users. Okay, so as far as the use case goes on how I'm going to be setting up the appliance, well, I'm going to pretend I have a company by the name of Tim Hansen Incorporated. I'll have a domain name of timhanson.ca. I do have a wildcard or a trusted wildcard domain certificate I want installed. I'm going to get my users to authenticate through my Active Directory domain controller. And then I'm going to be configuring VPN access for my sales employees to access a terminal server on the internal network. Okay. Additionally, I'm going to use endpoint control to check that the computers my employees have been given and are going to be connecting from have number one, SonicWall's endpoint protection capture client installed on it. And then number two, I'm going to check for the presence of a little hidden text file I've pushed out via group policy to the C drives for those computers. And this is going to be used as a method to ensuring my VPN users are connecting from those corporate owned or company owned devices as opposed or rather to personal devices or personal laptops. Okay, there's a ton of different ways of doing this check, this corporate computer check, but again, I'll just use this one as it is a fairly simple example. Okay, let's jump right into it. I'll switch over to my browser here. You can access the administrative interface by punching in HTTPS, followed by the, or I should say HTTPS colon, whack whack, followed by the IP address you entered in during the host settings part of the initial installation. And then of course you'll want to use port 8443 which is the default admin port for the device. It should load the setup wizard automatically like you see here and then from here it'll just go through a pretty standard guided setup of the basic settings. We'll leave this as is because we're not, of course, using CMS. We're just deploying this as a standalone appliance. Fill in my password here. Pick my time zone. Okay. The appliance name I'll leave as is, and then we'll need to decide whether we want a single interface or two interfaces on this device. If you want the SMA to sit in the DMZ off of a firewall like I'm doing, pick a single interface. Otherwise, if separate external and internal interfaces work better for integration into your existing network, you'll of course want to pick dual interfaces. Okay, gateway settings, all pretty self-explanatory. I'll throw in my domain name and DNS server here. Okay, I'll leave this blank. And then we're going to select the initially deny all access. The, this being the more secure option out of the box, giving a sort of zero trust type experience. And then we should be able to, or we should be good to hit the finish button, after which it'll take a minute or two at most to apply the changes and complete the setup. So I'll go ahead and fast forward to that point here. 
Okay, and now we should be able to log into the appliances UI. And once we're logged in, we'll be on this management console dashboard, which of course shows, well, typical dashboard things, resource consumption, licensing, etc., etc. Now, the first thing I recommend doing is installing the license. Okay, so to get the license file, you'll want to log into my SonicWall, go to tenant products, if you haven't already registered the appliance, go ahead and do so now. Otherwise, if I click on the SMA I have here, uh, go over to Licenses, I'll be able to hit the Manual Upgrade drop-down and then click this to download the key set file. I find it takes a couple seconds for the download to occur. Once it does, we can cycle back over to this other tab and you should see on the top right over here you got a little warning sign relating to the license and if you click on it it'll bring us over to the manage license page where of course we'll want to import the license choosing the file we just downloaded from my sonic wall and then once that's done hit upload and then as you'll see as we move through this video, really any change, including the uploading of the license file or the applying of the license file, has to get approved and pushed out through pending changes over here. Pending changes really gives us an opportunity to push changes out either immediately or schedule those changes for a day and time of our choosing. Okay, and then once that's done, we can go ahead and move on to the next step, which would be to apply or install my domain certificate. Everything related to certificates are over under system configuration and then SSL settings. We'll want to hit the little edit here, click the little plus symbol, and then of course select import to import our certificate. Your certificate needs to be in a P12 or PFX format, and this just ensures that the public certificate and the private key are bundled together in a single file. Enter your password, and then you can tick off to make this certificate the default appliance certificate and hit import. Once this is done, you've got your certificate now applied for user access, but not by default for administrative access. So if you do want, to be able to punch in the FQDN and have browser trust to the admin interface, what you want to do is click here and then select the certificate we just uploaded for the admin console as well. Okay. Right, and of course we'll apply the changes. And once the changes are applied, I should be able to go over and punch in the SMA's FQDN and as you can see I've got this little trusted lock symbol here okay now what's next let's go ahead and set up authentication authentication can be set up as a standalone configuration task or step but what I'm going to do is I'll create it during the realm creation process Okay, a realm is essentially a container which defines a single authentication server, as well as a few other things like access methods for our VPN users, endpoint control, zones, etc. The concept of a realm is tricky to wrap your head around at first, but as you begin to work with them on the appliance, it'll gradually make sense to you. Okay, so I'll click here to create a new realm. I'll go ahead and enter in my business name, Tim Hansen Incorporated and then I'll click the new button to create an authentication server. I'm working with a single domain using a username and password so I can use the Microsoft AD basic but as you can see here there's quite a wide variety of authentication methods supported on this box. Okay so after I hit here I can begin to fill in all the relevant info for my server All right, and then I'll go ahead and tick off to enable SSL. And here is where you'd also enable things like one-time passwords via email or SMS, or even time-based one-time passwords via something like a Google Authenticator. 
I would recommend setting up and testing Active Directory integration first before enabling multi-factor authentication. And this just makes troubleshooting a little bit easier if you're not having to throw in the additional step of fiddling around with OTP or TOTP. Okay, and then once you're done here, make sure you go back up to the top of the page and hit the test button just to ensure you've got all the settings right and the SMA can communicate with your domain controller, your Active Directory server. Once I hit the save at the bottom, or the save button at the bottom, it'll kick us back to the Realm Creation page. And if I open up the advanced section, you can see there's quite a number of additional options we could configure, right? So, thing I'm not going to go through all of them, but things like acceptable use policies, <laughs> a CAPTCHA, a group affinity, and such. And then when I'm happy with the page, I can go ahead and click Next, and then you'll see we're now looking at the Communities page. A community similar to Realms can be a concept that's a little tricky to grasp at first. If I expand the button for the default community, you can see a community is going to define things like the tunnel mode, the browser access, endpoint control, etc. You'll essentially have a community for each group requiring a different tunnel mode or a different endpoint control check or a series of endpoint control checks. I'm not going to use the default community, rather I'm going to go ahead and create a new community. And I'll do that by clicking here. I'm going to give my community a name that's rel relative to who it's going to be applying to. And then the members is where I will select the AD user group on my domain controller that my sales employees are members of. Once I hit edit, I can click new map to user or group, pick my realm in, under the drop down, and then click browse to launch into my domain directory through the domain controller. My sales group is under users, and once I've got that selected, I can hit use selected. And then I'll save this and tick off the sales group here. And once that's saved, I can hit the next button to come over to the Tunnel Access tab. First and foremost on the Tunnel Access tab, I'll need an IP address pool. An IP address pool determines how my VPN users are going to get an IP address when connecting to the VPN. And that would be through either Connect Tunnel or Mobile Connect. There's a couple different options here. What I'll do is I'll actually have the SMA issue DHCP assigned IP addresses by defining a range for a routed address pool. And this is honestly the simplest way of giving VPN clients IP addresses when they're connecting to the SMA. Okay. So Redirection mode is going to determine what traffic will be routed down the VPN tunnel when my users are connected. I only want my LAN subnets going down the VPN tunnel, so I'll pick split tunnel. Of course, if you wanted all traffic going down the VP VPN tunnel, you would pick redirect all. And this is essentially the same thing as tunnel all mode, this being probably a term that's more familiar to you. Okay. I'm not going to touch exclusions. I'll leave that as is. And then again, we've got a ton of options you could set according to your own security needs, right? So things like caching the credentials, always on VPN, various proxy settings, running scripts once you connect, etc., etc. Honestly, we spend all day going over these. So what I'll do is just keep it simple, leave everything as is, and move on. Okay, so hitting next. I'll be brought over to browser access. Whether or not you enable network tunnel client, aka on demand or port mapping, will be determined on how you want your VPN users connecting to the resources on your network. In my case, my terminal server. I'm not going to be touching port mapping slash redirection. 
on or in this video but I will come back to visit this page a little later on in order to enable tunnel or network tunnel client I'm sorry for now I'm just gonna leave both off and then I'll hit the next button to bring us over to endpoint control right so what I want out of endpoint control is when users are connecting to the VPN, I want endpoint control to validate that they're connecting from corporate owned devices. So I'm going to have one zone that performs that check. And then devices who fail the check are going to be thrown into the second zone I'm going to create and that being a quarantine zone. And being placed in this quarantine zone will of course deny access to any and all resources on my network. Okay, so let's go ahead and create my first zone and I'll name it something appropriate of course. There are some settings below that you may want to look at things like session timeout and whatnot. These things you can configure on your own if you need. There's actually not much to configure here initially when we're creating the zone. We can essentially name it, define any additional options and then click save. And then the second zone, like I mentioned before, is going to be a quarantine zone for users failing that corporate computers check. We could use the default zone, as you see here, setting the default zone to deny VPN access to anyone who falls in it. It would essentially accomplish the same thing as the quarantine zone. But in this case, as you can see, this gives us the ability, or the quarantine zone gives us the ability to sort of customize the messaging to give to users who fit into this zone and to also recommend URLs or links to them if they're falling into it, right? So things like pointing them to a help desk to get more information on why they're failing the check would be useful. Okay, and then once we've got both our zones created, we'll want to actually go up here and we'll want to move it over to in use to the right. Okay, so left is going to list all the zones we have created, but if we want the community to actually be using the zone, we've got to move it over to the right as such. So let's go ahead and hit next. So here is where, if you wanted to, you could get creative with how the workplace looks to users logging into the browser. So giving it your own logo, your own wording or terminology and whatnot. We'll, of course, leave it as is, and then we can go ahead and finish things here. Okay, so we can see we've got our sales community that we just created. And then we also have the default community that we elected not to use. I'm not using the default community, nor am I planning to in the future. So I'll go ahead and delete it just to get it out of the way. Okay, so we've got our realm created. We've got our community created. Now, what do we have left to configure? Well, we've got endpoint control to finish, right? So yeah, we created the zone, but we didn't actually define the checks that endpoint control is going to validate. We also need to define our terminal server as a resource. And then as a follow up to that, we'll want to or we'll need to set up access control permissions. Okay, and after all that, it should be simply a matter of testing everything out. Okay, so let's first head back over, I shouldn't say back over, we will head over to endpoint control. And number one, we'll want to click here to enable it. And then what we'll need to do is we'll need to create a profile to assign to our corporate computer zone we created as part of the community creation process. I'll go ahead and select Windows because my computers are Windows based. Obviously, if you need additional profiles for each operating system or device type, you would want to apply or you intend to apply endpoint control against, so you can create those profiles as needed. I'll define the capture client check first, right? So I can select anti malware under type, scroll down until I find SonicWall. And once that's done, I can simply hit add to current attributes. Okay, for the hidden file, I'll select file name under the type dropdown. And then I'll just define where I stuck the file on the corporate computers. The drive letter 
should be inserted as lowercase, just an FYI. Okay, and then once done, again, I'll click Add. And if I did have other attributes to define, I'd just essentially rinse and repeat until my profile is built out to my satisfaction. Okay, and then of course, I'll need to go back into the zone I created previously and add the profile to the zone. Okay. All right, so now that that's done, let's go ahead and define our terminal server. And we can do that here under resources. I'll go ahead and click here and then I'll want to choose hostname or IP. And then of course, I'll enter the IP address for my terminal server. All right, now that my terminal server is created, what I'll want to do is I'll want to move over to access control. You can see there's a default rule in place, and if I open it up, it will be granting all users access to the workplace. There's not anything necessarily wrong with this. For me, I like to see an explicit deny rule. So I'll actually set this rule to deny. And now I know no one is going to have access to anything, not even the workplace, unless I explicitly grant permission for them to have access. So how we move forward from here is really going to depend on how we want our VPN users to be able to access this terminal server I've created. And I'm going to look at three different ways or three different approaches. The first is going to be a pretty traditional approach where the VPN user would open a VPN client, in this case, Connect Tunnel, connect to the VPN, and then use the built in Microsoft RDP client to connect to the terminal server. Pretty much the exact same way you would access any other terminal server or workstation using RDP if you were on the local area network already. Number two is going to be through the browser-based workplace. So an end user would open a browser, type in the URL for the SMA appliance. They would log in using their username and password. And once they're in the workplace, they would be presented with a terminal server icon they would click on. Clicking on the icon will open another tab and they'll be utilizing a HTML5 RDP session in that additional tab. And then the third approach is going to be a hybrid of sort between number one and number two. Okay, so the user will connect to the workplace via the browser. But once they log in, Connect Tunnel will automatically connect to the VPN. And then once connected to the VPN, the user would have the option of either connecting to the terminal server using, again, the Microsoft native VPN client or the terminal server icon in the workplace, which they could click on to fire up that additional HTML5 RDP tab. And the main highlight of this method isn't to show that you can connect to the terminal server using the HTML5 method or the Microsoft native VPN client, rather, its intention is to show that you can essentially chain the authentication between the workplace and connect tunnel, right? So that opens up other use cases for the appliance that we're not going to explore in this video just due to time sakes. Now, keep in mind, the three methods I'm showing you are by no means all inclusive on the ways you can configure SMA or the potential use cases that the SMA would be suited for. These are just a few of the more basic methods which are hopefully sufficient in getting you started with configuring this device. Okay, so let's go ahead and switch back to my browser. And assuming you're following along with me, all we should have to configure moving forward to set up access is to create a access control rule. Okay, so I'll create a rule here. I'll select the sales user group for from, and then for to, I'll start with adding in connect tunnel. And that's for really two reasons. 
One being, of course, that, well, I want my users to be able to connect to the SMA using Connect Tunnel. And then also, two, I want my users, when they log into the workplace, to be presented with an icon that says Connect Tunnel and for them to have the option to download and install it from there. Okay, if I am going with this route, I will need to add in the workplace here as well. Now, if you're distributing the Connect Tunnel software and the endpoint control package through some sort of RMM tool, your users really wouldn't need to go to the workplace, so you'd be able to just exclude or not add a workplace in here, okay? I'll leave it in just because I want to demonstrate the whole process. And then last but not least, we've got the terminal server resource we'll need to add as well. Otherwise, when VPN users connect to Connect Tunnel and try to RDP to it, their traffic will just get dropped. Okay, I'll specify my corporate computer zone for endpoint control. And then we can look at all the advanced options and see quite the assortment of additional options to further restrict or control access through this rule. Right, so everything from restricting or allowing traffic based on the operating system, the client source IP address, time of day, etc., etc. I'll leave again everything as is and save the rule. And then of course I'll want to apply the changes. And now I should be able to switch over to my client test machine and test everything out. We'll assume my client machine has nothing installed on it yet, so I'll need to access the workplace to get the Connect Tunnel, the Connect Tunnel software. So throwing in the URL with port 443 will bring me to the user login page. There's my <laughs> lovely acceptable use policy. And of course the CAPTCHA. So you can see right away once I've authenticated, endpoint control will kick in automatically and as a starting point verify whether I have the secure endpoint manager software installed on my machine. And this is the actual software that runs on the machine checks for the presence of capture client, the hidden test file and any other attributes I've added to my EPC policy. If it's not already installed, it'll be queued up here to download and install, which of course I'll go ahead and do. And then I should be able to press the continue button to move forward. Once I've pressed here, you'll see an additional install which will fire up automatically. And this is going to work in combination with the secure endpoint manager to perform those EPC checks I mentioned. And once that's all done and my desktop or my PC has been verified to be a corporate owned device, it'll kick me right over to the workplace. So the only thing I'll see in the workplace is of course going to be my connect tunnel icon. So I'm going to use that to download and install the software. Okay, and then once the install is done, I can go ahead and open Connect Tunnel. And if I wanted to, I could hit the Connect button, but I'll just show you here that the deta details of the SMA are already pre-populated in the client, as you can see. And this is a nice feature to have, of course, not having to worry about your users needing to populate this information themselves. Once I throw in the username and password, you'll see endpoint control will run and verify that I'm connecting from a corporate computer as per my endpoint control policy we created. Okay, and it'll do this each time regardless if I'm connecting to the workplace or through Connect Tunnel. Okay, and I'm connected now. And at this point, I should be able to open the Microsoft RDP client throw in my server details, this assuming I don't already have the RDP shortcut sitting on my desktop to click, and connect. 
and it's easy as that. If I did have additional resources on my network that I wanted to give my VPN users access to, it would be a simple matter of just creating these resources and then adding them to the access control rule, and away we go. Okay, so moving on to the second way I can give access to my terminal server, that being through the browser-based HTML5 RDP method. Okay, and this is, of course, without the need to connect to the VPN using Connect Tunnel. Okay, so what I want to do, I want to move back to my admin interface and then open my access control rule. I already have the terminal server listed as a resource, but what I don't have yet, if you recall on my client machine when connecting to the workplace, is a little terminal server icon for me to even click on. So these little icons are referred to as shortcuts. So what I'll need to do is I'll need to create or configure my terminal server shortcut so it shows up in the workplace for my users. And to do this, I'll want to head over to Workplace, and then it should put me into the shortcut tab automatically. On the shortcut tab, I can go ahead and click New, and then for terminal server or for RDP, I want to select graphical terminal shortcut. The resource I created previously, which of course has the IP address or URL, is populated automatically because, well, it's the only one I've created. I want to hit the next button and then move over to the advanced options. And there's really two things I want to change here. One is to select Use Browser-Based Client, so when I click it, it actually opens in the browser. And then two, for ease of use, I'll select Forward User Session Credentials. And this will use the domain credentials the user used to log into the workplace for the RDP session, thus eliminating the need for the user to enter in his or her credentials multiple times throughout the process. And then like everything else on the appliance, there's a ton of options below for you to be able to customize the RDP experience. Okay, I'll just go ahead and finish to, or press finish to create it. And then after that's done, I can move back over to my access control rule again. The only thing I'll need to do here in my rule is to remove connect tunnel since obviously I don't need my users to be able to see the icon or to be able to connect to the VPN in order to access the terminal server through the browser. Okay, and then I'll go ahead and commit the changes. and then move back over to my client test machine. I'll disconnect from connect tunnel and then just for giggles I'll show you if I try to reconnect you can see that it's well not going to happen because of course I removed connect tunnel from my access control rule. And then if I log out, or if I just refresh the page and log in again, there, I can see the terminal server shortcut now. And if I click on it, and there we go, I get logged into the terminal server and can do whatever I need to do so I can get paid at the end of the day. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that's pretty basic. That's pretty simple for setting up the browser-based access. And again, if I had additional resources on my network that I wanted to give my users access to, I would configure the resource, create the shortcut, add the shortcut, or I'm sorry, add the resource to the access control rule, and we'd be good to go. Okay. Now, moving on to the third method of access I explained previously, sort of the hybrid between the first two methods. 
The difference being between this method and the last two is that for the last two, authentication through the workplace was one step and authentication through Connect Tunnel was a separate step. So if users needed workplace access through shortcuts via the workplace and through the VPN access via Connect Tunnel, they would need to authenticate multiple times. And this is obviously not the most efficient way of doing things. What we want is to be able to authenticate once in order to get access to both the workplace and the VPN. And this is kind of what I'll be showing you how to set up here. Okay, so let's first head back to Realms and then open up Browser Access. And what we want to do under Browser Access is to enable the on-demand network tunnel client. Once enabled, save it, and then head back over to the access control rule we have created. I want to add connect tunnel back in there, and then save the rule. And then let's go ahead and apply the changes over here. And once that's done, head back over to our client machine. I'll refresh the browser session, and then log in again. and watch what happens when I log in. There, you can see Connect Tunnel chains the authentication and logs into the VPN automatically. And then once I'm logged in, I get the option of accessing whatever bookmarks are configured here, right? So for me, it's just the terminal server. As well, I'll have access to whatever applications I've been granted access to over the VPN. Again, in my case, it's simply a terminal server, but in yours, it could be a multitude of other resources. And that's pretty much it. That's everything I wanted to cover today. Again, by no means all-inclusive on the use cases or even the feature set of the SMA 1000 series, but I hope it's at minimum sufficient to get you started and help you understand the workflow as you deploy your own device. Okay, so that's it for today. I'll say thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.